Welcome to the Low Carb Lifestyle Long Weekend. I'm really excited to be joined by Dr. Peter Ballasted. Thank you very, very much for being a part of the summit, Peter. Well, thank you for the invitation, Tracy. I'm glad to uh, hopefully contribute. Well, I know you will contribute. I absolutely love the work that you do and, uh, you know, share share your work widely because I think it's very, very important that people, you know, really do understand what it is that you, you do and, you know, certainly there's a lot we can learn around the benefits of nutrition and animal source foods and things like that. So we're going to get into all of that, which is great, but I'd love to start with your um your view on health and what it covers does it cover more than nutrition when we're talking about health what are we really talking about here indeed it it, it is more than merely nutrition as important as nutrition is um you know food is such a integral part of our cultures our family lives or lives with those that we share the most meaningful relationships. And if we focus too much on the nutrition aspect, we miss all those other key aspects as well. And another way to look at it is as important as proper nutrition is, if somehow we're suffering from addiction or dysfunction of some sort in our lives, the nutrition alone is not going to address those key issues. So what is health? Health is what allows us each to be as much as we are capable of being. And, and without that, then somehow it's diminished. And there's lots of ways that that can happen. And I understand that we're all struggling in various ways. But I think one of the ways that we can each be healthier is by finding a way to help other people. And so that's one of the things that I love about what I find in the low carb slash keto slash whatever we want to call it community, that a lot of this is our sharing what we found with other people who have themselves been to one degree or another struggling. So that's a way to help others. And then maybe we can grow communities that way. And I think human beings were meant to live in communities. And if we're isolated, then I think that's kind of not healthy either. So long-winded answer to your question. No, it's, an, it's a fantastic answer. And I think it is really important. And I, it's something that um, I've learned a lot. My husband is Greek and has grown up as part of the, the Greek community here in Melbourne. But very, you know, I think we can learn, certainly, you know, I was born in, in Australia, grew up in Melbourne. My family was important, but I think I've learned so much really as to the importance of family and how it's so intertwined. You know, just as an example, we had, we've we're recording this just after Easter and um, we had our family around. It's not Orthodox Easter for four more weeks, but we still all got together here on Sunday. And, you know, my husband cooked a, a suvla, which is the Greek spit. You know, we've got, you know, the setup here and just everybody sitting around it. You know, I just really reflected on how important the, the food is in bringing everyone together and that that community, that spirit, the chance, you know, for my husband to talk to his sons, you know, about things that don't just happen in day-to-day -day life. I, I really think that's important. And we were talking actually about Ansel Keys and how, you know, he did a lot of his research based on, you know, the Mediterranean diet, but really he missed that key aspect of community. And I think it is so important to bring it in. Yeah, I, he missed a lot just in that, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, the, the idea that he took food, you know, intake data during, you know, Lent, Lent in, an, or in an observant population. Um, there's lots of things there, but indeed that, as I said, it's part of culture. It's part of that history. And 
again, I think animal source foods are a critical part of that. And when people talk about somehow eliminating those, then there's more being eliminated than the essential nutrition that they provide. And on the other side of that, I think people get so, the danger is people get too focused on label claims and, and you know, that it's, it's got to be produced this way or what have you, that one, some people think, well, if I don't do that, then I shouldn't do it at all or that I have to somehow spend more for this product because of the perceived benefits from this form of animal source food as opposed to another one. And then that creates stress and stress itself we know is not good. It's not healthy. And so, you know, you could think about financial stress. You could think about the, the stress of, preparing food in families that are struggling just to, you know, work however many jobs they're doing or with whatever resources they have. And so part of this, we really, I think, need to take a step back and say, how certain are we of the basis of some of the claims that we can frequently hear within our community, let alone what the health you know, authorities are coming at us with, because I think they're all, they all need to be examined in the light of what we truly know versus what we think we know versus what we hope it would be. Mm, absolutely. So sh can we talk about that then, you know, let's, let's examine some of those claims, you know, first of all, the one that I hear almost every day and just, you know, from my brother last week, um, eating animal food, animal source foods, will it kill us? Well, um, clearly not, but I understand exactly where that's coming from. We've been told that eating saturated fat, which we've been taught to consider almost synonymous with all, you know, all fats from animal source products must be saturated. Well, that's not true. We know that. We know that the fat we get from animal source foods is a mixture of saturated, monounsaturated, polyunsaturated fats. We also know in this community that saturated fatty acids are not a health risk, naturally occurring saturated fatty acids. But people have been taught that. We also now have enough people who've had personal experience where they try eating, you know, beef, bacon, and eggs for one of a, a different description. And what do you know? Their, their health risk markers improve. So as somebody recently said, uh, I think I'm getting it from a quote in Gary Taubes' latest book, if you're, if you're confronted with a choice between a hypothesis and your experience, go with your experience. Hmm. And so people who, and, and again, this is an idea that I'm leveraging from him, but the benefit that we now have is that we can try this ourselves. We don't have to take somebody else's word. For the last half a century, we've been taking somebody else's word for, you know, if you eat this way, you will improve your risks of dying or you won't contract these diseases. They, they didn't have the data so we were taking their word for it. And part of what they were telling us would happen demonstrably has not happened. We have not gotten healthier as a result of following their advice. Now, it's not fair to say that we've gotten less healthy because of their advice, but it is fair to say that we haven't gotten healthier following their advice. So, okay. Um, so, there's a number of us who, from horse husbandry, I learned the term EC keeper, right? There are those horses which 
you don't have to feed them as much for them to stay in good flesh and in good condition and whatever. And then there's others, you know, typically the more thoroughbred blood in them, the hotter the blood in them, the, the, the less they are easy keepers that you need to feed them more. Okay. So there's some of us that are easy keepers. <laughs> <laughs> we are the we are the ones in Gary Taubes's words that fatten easily. We are the ones for whom the standard, the conventional advice doesn't work. We've tried it; it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Okay, so try something else. Oh, it works. Okay, so that's the bit about the it kills you. No, it won't. And and there's lots of evidence that we have. Um, certainly within a three month time frame, it won't kill you, right? That heart disease does not progress that fast. <laughs> mm. So you, people should be free, feel free to try this way of eating, this way of life for three months and see, do you lose weight? Do you feel better? Uh, if you've gotten, you know, metrics of health before and after are they going in a positive direction hmm. and just sort of continuing on with that then so if we make the decision and and we have that belief that okay we can eat meat and it will be okay uh what about do we have to buy grass-fed organic meat or yeah. you know well for first of all it i, I think that it's important to make sure that people understand there's there are many forms of animal source food mm -hmm. and somewhere along the line the language has gotten a little confused so i just want to make sure people understand that there are really by my understanding three dietary approaches you could be carnivore you could be vegan you could be omnivore <laughs> those are the three now Traditionally, vegetarian has come to mean I don't eat red meat, but too many people think it means I don't eat a lot of meat or animal source foods, right? So, so vegan is no animal source food. Carnivore is exclusively animal source food. Omnivore is somewhere in between. There's lots of animal source foods. Beef is just one of them. Um, and I just like to point out to people that even in cultures that don't eat beef, they do eat lamb or goat or chicken or fish or eggs or dairy. So people typically think of those cultures as vegetarian, but then when it comes to the West, they kind of miss what they do eat. So, so that's as background to this answer. And that is, it is far more important that you buy what you can afford, what is appropriate to you as an individual based on your culture, based on your personal choices and what's available. And the label claims I think are in many ways, just not important. And we could talk about that but I, I think that I would make the point that a lot of the label claims are the residue of some of the dietary confusion mm -hmm. that, um, you know, people um, were saying, well, you need to eat this way to avoid this disease. Well, maybe it's not all of the things, it's just those that are produced this way and now it becomes an industry claim. And now it, 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 if, if you've read Nina Teicholz's book and you've read about how the olive oil industry benefited, that's enough and coupled with my skeptical background to say, yeah, probably, oh, here's another way to put it. We've had, we're now in what, at least the second wave of the low carb revolution, Dr. Atkins, Dr. Eads, but maybe it's the third because before them was Pennington and before them were Donaldson and before, you know, so, so this is an idea that actually is the oldest diet that we've had, you know, when we think about diets and diet books and that kind of thing. So if I think about 
Atkins or Pennington or Eads or any, they didn't have the organic and the grass fed options, right? They didn't exist in the marketplace. Mm. So clearly they helped their patients get well. It is not a requirement to eat that way in order to get better health metabolically. Now, someone could argue, well, once we've done all this, then would it matter? Yeah, maybe. Don't know. Don't know. And, you know, when we start talking about things outside of what we know, that's how we got where we are. So let's focus on eating the appropriate diet for whoever we are and just sort of lighten up about some of these other things. Mm. I think that's a really important message for people to understand. You know, um, it's like discussion I have a lot. <clears throat> um, you know, I'm a mom. We've got five children, seven mouths to feed in the family. You know, and I say very honestly, you know, I, I can't afford to buy grass-fed organic meat. I just I can't afford to do it. And people are like, you know, quite shocked because it is one of those things that I think is becoming just common knowledge and a and a belief. But you know. It's not necessarily backed up in the data, you know, I've, I've heard you say that. And I just think it's such a good way to put it. Just do eat what you can afford. Um, but, of course, then I've had back to me that moral argument, well, we have to as, you know, what about the planet, you know, regenerative farming, organic, all that type of thing, grass-fed, it's better for the planet. So we have a moral choice. Well, um, yeah, you know. so the first thing the first thing that we should make sure people understand is that those beliefs about those systems are not necessarily true, number one. Number two, m morality conversations make me very nervous because you've, you're setting up a system where anybody that disagrees with you in whatever degree is therefore immoral. And who, except for you know, the very sick among us. So yeah, I'm not moral, you know, or it, it just, it, so that just sort of sets up another argument. Um, mm -hmm. For example, organic does not mean without pesticides. Organic means it's raised with some pesticides that have been licensed for use within organic systems. It says nothing about the toxicity of them. It says nothing about the environmental impact. Okay, um, you know, grass-fed, grass-finished, first of all, we could talk about that, but grass-finished doesn't mean a lower impact on the environment. And we could talk about that, but again, that's getting a little too far down in the weeds. If you like to eat grass-finished meat, by all means, do that. Now, we're probably, you know, we're, we're at ruminants here because... You really can't feed swine grass. You can run them on pasture, but you're feeding them grain. You can mm -hmm. run chickens on pasture, but you're feeding them grain. Um, the nature of the beasts, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, so, again, I, I just want to make sure that, that I, I guess maybe my role is to be um, the contrarian a little bit and just make sure that, you know, we're not drifting outside of our expertise. And that's a caution to me, and it's easy for me to do. So, uh, you know, here, take my advice. I'm not using it. Um, I'm trying to make sure that no one feels like, if I can't afford this, I might as well not even try. And I'll tell you one anecdote of mine, um, giving a presentation, and this is years ago, and a gentleman who's, I respect him as a dairyman. He's a, a organic dairyman. He, one of the best grazing management dairies in the area that I know of in the country. And from the audience, he told me at the end of a presentation about therapeutic carbohydrate reduction and why we you know, should be, he said, well, if you're not going to get them to eat an entirely organic food diet, then you might as well leave them on the standard American diet. Okay. So what that tells me is we're now dealing with belief system, not objective data. And, and, and so I've seen that again and again. Um, 
you know, I can go buy organic pop tarts at, uh, you know what the pop tarts yep. are? Mm -hmm. That may not translate, um, you know, um, and, and, you know, the organic vegan sugar, right, yeah. is a thing. I've seen it in the supermarket. So at, at, at well, carbon free sugar, that was another one that I have. A, That's new. A, <laughs> yeah. So, and, and depending on how you want to look at the food, how you want to measure your output, one could make the case that sugar production has the lowest carbon footprint. Well, okay, but what about the footprint of diabetes? What about, uh, so some of these arguments have been misinterpreted. They've been unfairly oversimplified. They've been completely misstated and yet they're out in the conversation. So we need to help people take a step back from some of that focus on their own health and that value. And again, one of my things is when you improve your health, you are improving the world. And it may be the most impactful thing that we can each do as individuals. Um, so I, I'd like to get that message across. I'm also working with others to get people to recognize that chronic illness has an environmental cost. And I also want people to understand that there is such a thing as too little animal source food in the human diet. We can see that around the world. It's not just a thing in the low and middle income countries. It occurs in the high income countries as well. Um, and so the, the other end of that argument is to get people to recognize that what we've been told about too much animal source food in the human diet is largely based on some very flawed methodology that broadly is called nutritional epidemiology of chronic disease. This idea that you can identify a group of people and you can accurately estimate what they eat on a daily basis through food frequency questionnaires, then that alone is enough or that you have the ability to characterize them versus another population. And then 20, 30, 40 years down the road, whatever diseases they've got, you can form meaningful statistical inferences. It, no, you can't. We don't know that. Mm. And, and, and yet we have all kinds of other data of higher quality to say this is not a problem. So it, it, we, we, if you go back in the literature and you look at some of the the studies where they were trying to say this is the difference between grass finished and conventional finished beef, for example, and how many times they say, well, you know, saturated fat has been linked to heart disease and cholesterol in the diet has been linked to heart disease. And it's like, what? No, 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 no. Stop. Stop mentioning that as a justification for whatever you're about to do, because there is no there there anymore. We know that now that, that mm. that's gone. So we're, we're left with the cleanup work. So how has that happened? I mean, it just seems, you know, like to me, it's like it mind boggling and it just keeps going and, you know, the engine's going and it's very hard to, to undo a lot of these beliefs, but, how, you know, how has it happened like this? Um, Can we blame Ansel Keys? <laughs> well, he certainly deserves some of it. Um, but even at the end, it, it was like what Frankenstein's monster that he had created this thing yeah. that in the end killed him. Uh, at the end, he couldn't get his work published because he wanted to question some of these related issues. Um 
I, I think that there's a number of factors at play and, you know, I'm going to point to Gary Taubes's books and Nina Teicholz's books and others for people to get an idea of just exactly what took place. Um, but it's very clear that we had um, industry interests. We had um, personality interests. So there, there, were a, there were a handful of personalities with, within the research community that pushed this idea very, very hard. And that's how they created their careers. And at the same time, we had other interests that, you know, tie into various faiths. And I recommend that people listen to Belinda Fetke and what she's been uncovering to recognize just how big a part that played. Um, we had various um, um, professions that got in various ways committed to one track. Um, and therefore, it becomes very hard for them to then shift their position. Um, and on top of that, this, this coincided very nicely with a social movement of its time, the 60s and 70s counterculture. The, the, the emerging environmental movement played, you know, this was related to all that. And the dietary guidelines in part were in response to all that. It was a political mm -hmm. movement. It was a social movement. And, you know, once we um, got various um, organs of government involved, institutions involved, bureaucracies involved, then change becomes even harder. And uh, one of my graphics that I shamelessly leveraged from Adele Height is of um, a crystal water glass. And so it's, you know, three quarters, two thirds full of water. And then there's a little stream of oil coming down into it. And so they're little globules of oil because of course, oil and water don't mix. And, and the tagline is that science not equal to policy. And in fact, to a certain extent, they are polar opposites. That mm -hmm. science, when it's functioning properly, should constantly be challenging itself and trying to disprove itself and questioning and retesting. And policy, once it's established, it's like, nope. <laughs> you know, there, there are these institutional antibodies that come out and attack anything that smacks of change to defend itself because now you've got budgets, now you've got regulations, now you've got careers and you know all of that involved that really, really, really resist that change. And so this is in part how we get to where we are. Um, you know, one of, one of the political things was politicians need to appear to be doing something. When there's a crisis, I've got to come with the answer. I don't have time to see if I'm right, hmm. <laughs> is essentially one of the, the quotes from the 70s era. But by that time, there was already a lot of movement behind this. And so it wasn't as if this just sprang anew in the late seven in the US, um, there, there was movement for a decade or more moving down this track. So uh, long, another long winded answer to how we got here. Mm. And so in the meantime, while uh, the vested interests and there's so much at stake, you know, we do have to take, I suppose, some individual responsibility in terms of choice of, of what it is that that we do. Um, I've got a quote I love to share that um, I'd rather have a mind open with wonder than closed by belief. And I think it's, you know, that human nature that once we think we know something where we, we, we don't realise how much it does close us off to believing some, to be, you know, believing anything new or evolving or seeing something new. So I think, you know, as individuals, if we can see beyond a lot of that, we will help that ripple effect of of change and of course we, what we know about politicians is 
you know, they will go with the masses eventually, won't they? <laughs> well, I, I saw a couple things. One, the opposite of skeptical is gullible. Okay. Um, and the, the change aspect. So back to we, uh, um, I think I got this from uh, Dr. Ken Barry. It, if you're like I was at one time, like many people within this community realize that you're in some way not metabolically well, not healthy, metabolically speaking. Um, it's not your fault, but it is your problem. Yeah. That you can't wait for other people to come with the pill or come with the treatment. That we are, in, in some ways, some have said it'll be 30 or 50 years before this all gets sorted out. I, I don't know if that's true, but I know I can't wait that long. Um, so, I, I, and I don't think anybody else should either. Um, and I think that we, we, we in the high income countries have options available to us. M most of us in high income countries have options to us that people in low and middle income countries do not yet have. And so, um, we can find those, like I said, affordable, appropriate products. I don't know if I shared with you the last time we visited the spam story. Mm, um, I'm not sure. I may have heard it, but I don't know. Yeah. Please share it. <laughs> okay. So spam, for those who don't know, is a canned pork product. It, it um, they, they, I guess Hormel started because they had cuts of uh, shoulder and ham that weren't going into whatever other products that they were producing. And so their people figured out how they could take that and add some flavor spice to it and then put it in a can and have a shelf stable, stable product. So, you know, in some parts of the world, spam is one of the basic food groups. Um, and yet, it's been demonized in many people's eyes as, you know, a processed meat. And someone at one of the conferences that I spoke at came up at this sort of uh, visitation session. And she thanked me for my message about buy what you can afford. And um, she said, like you, she said, I have three teenage boys. I cannot afford to feed them, you know, so... Um, you know, thank you for freeing me of the guilt of not trying. And she shared that she, they love to eat spam, you know, slice it, fry it, a couple eggs and they're good. Okay. Um, her mother was visiting and so she was making lunch for her boys and she's cooking spam and she apologizes to her mother for cooking spam. And her mother said, oh no, I love spam. And this was news to her. Like this was a great revelation about her mother. And she said, yeah, yeah. Her mother had been like a 15 year old in Berlin during the airlift. You familiar with that mm. piece of history? Mm. So there's a untold story there. If she was 15 during the airlift, how old was she during the Russian occupation before? Okay. Um, yeah, not um, in any case. So during the airlift, spam was one of the things that could be brought in. And so her line was spam tastes like freedom. Oh. And so, um, and again, this is part of this story of family and culture and history and it's more than protein and fat and carbohydrates and right. It, there's just this entire um, story. Um, and then on top of that, we could look at 
what the lack of animal source food produces in diminishing human lives globally. And, and that's a very real thing that I'm getting more and more interested in because I think that's an effective way to answer the people that are coming at us with these other messages. Um, but um, in any case, what we always need to keep in mind is when people make claims, where are the, what is the basis for those claims? So somebody's going to say, you know, that this, you know, this kind of food production produces that kind of impact. Where did you get that data from? Do you, do you know that or are you repeating something that you heard? And time and time again, when you go into the data, you find that the claims are not supported by the research. And so now we're back to hypothesis versus experience. Now we're back to your health is more important than somebody's ill-founded claim. A young woman's ability to have children is more important than somebody's claim about how eating less animal source food will save the planet in a hundred years. The increasing the chance of somebody dying with all the toes they were born with by eating a diet higher in animal source foods, which has been documented, it's demonstrated, it's not debatable is more important than the claims that are made against animal source food production, which frequently have very little connection to reality. They don't understand agriculture, they don't understand food systems, they don't understand the interrelationship today between animal source food production and plant source food production. They don't understand there's no either or, right? But they make these claims as if there is. And at the end of the day, their ill-founded belief ends up diminishing the lives of human beings today, not a hundred years from now, today. And I just find that remarkable when we can drill down to, you know, what's the statistics? Every 30 seconds, someone in the world loses a lower leg due to diabetes. Today in the United States, 200 some people are going to have some part of their body cut off due to the standard of care for diabetes. This, this is a global pandemic that has been running for decades and will run for decades unless we get it sorted. And what it means is that all of our estimates about what constitutes a healthy diet need to be rethought. Well, if we need to rethink all those, then all of our conceptions about the necessary food systems to support a global population need to be rethought. Here's one. It is projected that by 2050, so 29 years from now, we're going to, we're, there will be an increased demand by 66% for animal source protein. Okay, that's, that's the UN or projection. Well, one, we now know that that's based on the RDA, which is a low target. It's very low threshold, so it needs to be higher. Number two, we also know that as we age, we need more. And we know that the average age is going to increase as we approach 2050 because we're a growingly older population. It's not that the, the population growth between now and 2100, roughly 2 billion people, um, and maybe it's even less than that. Maybe it's 2050, I'm a little fuzzy on that for a moment. Um, but what, whatever that 2 billion increase in population is not from children. It's from human beings getting to live longer. So many of these conversations that are being had need to be rethought in light of the actual data. 
And, and part of my hope is that I can help people have those conversations. But in the meantime, if we'll each do the best for ourselves and for our families, I'm convinced that we will hasten the time of that tipping point. That, first of all, the market will respond. The, the market is really good at mm. sensing where trends and, and, and chasing that. So, and we're already seeing it with various products, which we could talk about because I don't think that those products necessarily are necessary. I, but I understand that, you know, people are seeing an opportunity and okay, that's capitalism. That's fine. Um, but it's important for people to recognize that whatever food system you're going to you know feed from has environmental impacts everyone and we're not really good at estimating what they are but here's something for people to kind of try to get their minds around and i'm just going to speak us i'll speak I, unfortunately, I still don't know Australian data, bad Pete, no donut. I should know that. Um, the EPA in the United States Environmental Protection Agency puts out a budget of sources and sinks for greenhouse gas for anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions. So for those greenhouse gases that are produced by human activity. In the category that agriculture resides in, which is agriculture, forestry, and land use, roughly 10% of the total emissions come from that category. Okay, less than half 10. of that, hmm, 10. 10%, one, okay. Mm -hmm. One zero point zero, or one naught point naught, sorry. Um, animal agriculture is less than half of that. but they also account for sinks. So that one category that's 10% sequesters enough carbon to represent 12% of the total emissions. So in the United States today, already today, agriculture, forestry, land use is a net negative emitter now, could we do better? Sure. As we learn more, we'll learn, you know, the numbers will change, but that's where the estimates are today. Wow. Agri beef and dairy are really the first industries to do life cycle analyses for their emissions. And okay, then we can look, we can look globally at somewhere around four. Yeah, a little fuzzy on those numbers, so I won't cite them. I've done it elsewhere. They can be found. The IPCC is where you have to look. They do a similar sort of breakout. And yes, they're also net negative globally. Mm. That, that combination. And there's some issues there because a lot of these are just estimates. There's no, there, there's very little measurement going on here, but that's where we are in terms of understanding. So when people say what they say, we need to kind of take a step back and say, wait a minute. Now, there are lots of industries playing a part in the total. Which ones of those are actually sequestering carbon today? Which ones of those are dealing with more biological cycling than fossil fuel use today and, and get maybe a different you know, view on it? So I really, really, really hope that people who are coming into this space are already here will, like I say, more value their own health more mm. than some of these still model-based predictions. And, and again, 
just like we took somebody's word for if you eat this way, you'll avoid these diseases. And now we're like, oh, maybe not so much. We're being asked to take people's word for it mm. in these other aspects. And, and maybe we should find a way to just kind of disengage from that whole conversation or ask people, yeah, you know, what is it? In God, we trust all others must bring data. <laughs> I love that. So just to get a, a little summary there for people listening, you know, what you've certainly shown is that eating animal source foods, and you've been very clear that it's not just beef, we're talking about are the ruminants, chicken, pork, fish, um, you know, eggs and dairy. So eating animal source foods won't kill you, um, you know, and, of course, red meat, as we just said, is one, and there's clear high-quality evidence of the harm from too little and no high-quality evidence of the harm for too much, and that is a big issue, particularly when we're looking at countries that can't afford to supplement, can't afford to, you know, yeah, do what a lot of people have the luxury of in the West if they choose not to eat animal source foods. So for me, you know, that really covers that, you know, as a mum and someone trying to do my best for my family and my children, you know, I'm definitely comfortable with making the choice to eat what I can afford in terms of animal source foods. So then we've talked about how eating animal source foods also won't kill the planet because that's often the flow on, oh, look, I get it for my health, but I have such a, a guilt around, um, you know, eating meat or animal source foods and the, the environment. And you've clearly showed too that, you know, again, there's very, you know, well, people are talking about the wrong thing, whether it's made up evidence or you know, no evidence at all, but it, again, missing, yeah, it's, and it just gets pulled up into, again, that dogma of fact when it's Well, and, and yeah, so, you know, the figures, it's a little unfair, um, but depending on how you do the accounting, just for scale, the, the U.S. healthcare system has been estimated to produce 10% of the greenhouse gas emissions in the United States. Now, again, EPA accounts for things differently than was done in this, but the point still is that the healthcare industry has an environmental impact. Yeah. And another series uh, estimation said that if, if the average type two diabetic in the United States could eliminate their medication use, they would reduce their carbon footprint 29% more than if they went from a high meat to a vegan diet. Now, wow. imagine, is that possible? What, what could you, is just, okay, we're speculating wildly. Perhaps there may be someday might be a way that a type 2 diabetic could eliminate or reduce medication use. And again, the pharmaceutical industry has a environmental footprint. And up until now, there hasn't been a lot of focusing on that. The medical health care also has a significant um, pollution impact in various ways beyond greenhouse gas emissions. And it's not to say we get rid of it. No, obviously not. Yet, of course, when we talk about livestock agriculture, people will say get rid of it. I'm like, wait, wait, wait a minute. Um, I like to advocate that people, you know, I'm not that kind of doctor, right? I'm not, I'm not a physician, but I do advocate that people take their daily meds, meds, M-E-D-S, meat, eggs, dairy, seafood, take one or more daily. Um, you know, a steak a day keeps the doctor away. Uh, again, I'm not that kind of doctor. I can tell people <laughs> how much fertilizer to put on their pasture. I can tell people how to plant grass and manage grass and do all that. But along the line, I've gotten to learn some things that have helped me personally. They've helped my colleagues in my disciplines. And so now my hope is that by maybe bridging the gaps that have developed between the 
food production and the human health and nutrition communities, we can, you know, like I say, build some bridges, tell a more end to end holistic story and get more people to be healthy, live more fully the lives that they've been given, um, you know, raising children, teaching them how to cook, hmm. uh, teaching them those kinds of life skills. And then the lessons that come during that shared time. Um, and again, these, these are not meant to be, you know, gender specific roles. These are meant to be family shared time. Um, and I understand that, for many people, it's a challenge, especially the last year plus. Um, and so those are some of the things that we ought to be um, striving to, to find solutions to, um, to help others. Um, we ought to have food security programs that ensure that people are getting the appropriate food rather than the stuff that is currently subsidized and many other things but starting from this idea of what is what is a species appropriate diet for a human mm. being mm. Mm. that's really great i think you know really what i've gotten i've listened to so much of you of of you peter and you know obviously i've talked to you before but i think really today it's really sunk in that you know we need to help people have those conversations in their head and new stories around their impact. And as you say, you know, like all food production has impact, you know, we need to, you know, really broaden that story that if you're eating vegetables, you have had no impact on animals. So, you know, we let's mm -hmm. broaden all of that. But also, you know, that, that story around, well, actually, if I really want to help the environment, I can start by the health of, you know, myself and my family and, you know, again, and helping people hear that story of the impact that, you know, medications and um, health or um, poor health have on the planet. I just, you know, I I'm so grateful that you're sharing that because I think that's actually really sunk in for me for the first time. Even though I'm in the in the space, I listen to the conversations, but still sometimes it could be the the tenth time we hear things that it really make, has an impact and. Um, it's definitely something I'm going to take away from that the conversation today. Well, I'm grateful for the opportunity and thank you again for your support. Thank you for what you're doing. And uh, uh, yeah, I wish us all good health. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Well, just to, I don't want you to go quite yet. Just would love you just to, you know, wrap it up for me in terms of, yeah, just a, a final message that um, you might be able to give the people who are, who are watching. Oh, well, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah. No, that's fine. Um, I, I think it's really, really important for those of us in this who are undergoing this kind of a journey to have people around us that can support us in it. Um, because if we're trying to do this on our own, then other, you know, it's, it, 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 it helps run with a herd, swim with a buddy is another idea that, that um, find those people that can help you um, and be gentle with yourself about the changes um, don't expect too much, um, and don't beat yourself up over any stumbles, pick yourself back up, you know, fall down twice, get up twice. Okay. We're good. Um, somebody said, if, if, if you were driving down the road and you sideswiped one car, when you made the turn onto the road, you wouldn't hit every other car going down the road, right? It's okay. <laughs> Just, to try to try to adjust and and improve um there's lots of resources you know that that are available uh now today compared to to when i started certainly and people should feel free to try evaluate adapt there's no one size fits all and that's part of the, the thing that we have to get past is we've had this top down approach to advice and advice that's based on a population approach. Well, 
I ain't a population and neither are you and neither is anyone else. We're individuals with our own sort of quirks. And we just need to find, again, what works for us as individuals and as members of a household. Um, and and the, the other thing that I would offer people is there's a way to do this without necessarily being you know, um, an evangelist to everyone who doesn't want to hear. Mm -hmm. And, and so uh, finding, there's a saying in the United States about, I'd rather watch a sermon than listen to one. Um, if, if we are able to achieve the improvements in our health that have been demonstrated again and again by members of this community and others globally, then people will ask, and that's the invitation. Um, somebody said that if every man is an island, our job is to paddle around until we find the right beach to land on. So be prepared, but you know you don't need to recite Gary Taubes to everyone. Believe me, I found this is true. You don't have to, to everyone that you meet. You don't have to judge people when they're going to the donuts. Um, yeah. uh, and, and if, if offered no thanks is a full and sufficient answer. Um, so find a way there, there's, there's forgive the language, but there's a video that you can find on YouTube that goes something like, don't be a dick. Um, <laughs> and, and if you want to be persuasive, then we need to be attractive. Mm. And so if we, you know, carry the message, but not the mess is one that I got from somewhere else, but just be prepared. And if you get the opportunity, then just share that, no, I don't eat this. And this is what happened to me. And I guess that's the other, that, that our own experience is of enormous value. And that's back to the hypothesis versus experience. So if we get the opportunity, then we can share with someone. And, and meanwhile, we can think about where we each are and how, if given the opportunity, we might become effective in this. You know, I've, I've, I've spoken to people who run businesses, and so they've changed how you know, the snacks that are served in lunch break and, you know, quarterly, they've changed the wellness program, which typically is based on the nonsense health advice, but they're the employer. So they can change the information that's delivered and other people have become involved in their churches. Um, in one case, it was one of the pastors who lost I forget, 80 some pounds, whatever. And so they had some lessons. And in other cases, it's, you know, what they bring to a potluck, right? Um, you're not going to bring donuts anymore to a potluck if you've had this experience, right? So what That's are right. you going to bring? Yeah. Um, and so all of those things are opportunities, um, but we don't have to rush right out into it. We can kind of ease into it as we're becoming more established in this way of life. And, and that's, I guess, the last point to make is that it is a way of life. It is not a diet. It is how I will eat now. It is, it is how I eat, period, full stop. Mm -hmm. And I'm not doing this until some point, and then I'll go back to whatever. Mm -hmm. this, this, if, if you can't see yourself eating this way for the rest of your life, then we need to kind of spend some time around that. Um, so those, those are some closing ideas, I guess I'd offer. Yeah, they're wonderful. And uh, I, I heard you on a podcast say that, um, you know, we also need to stop listening to people that got us to where we got, you know, stop listening to the advice of people that were telling us the old things. And, you know, I think it can be hard to do that, but it's really important, you know, like go to doctors or listen to people that are teaching and showing you within, you know, this new 
way of thinking or yeah indeed um we we have um what the Society of Metabolic Health Practitioners has now got a website. You can find that. They've got a um, clinical guidelines. Um, they also have um, a, a, a provider locator, and you can get to those free. There's other resources available. Um, and there's just so much that's available to us today. We don't have to rely on the the experts anymore that mm. there are other sources of information and when you realize that the dietary guidelines as i said earlier they were a product of and i'll just name them the seventh day adventist church they were a product of the environmental movement they were a product of the counterculture movement and they were a product of industries that were interested the diet industry the exercise you know the 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 health and fitness industry of its day you know the processed food industries all of that produced what where we are today and it was done with some promises that and we can see they were wrong. It's, we don't have to take their word for it anymore. And we sh certainly shouldn't listen to them until they've demonstrated the ability to say I was wrong and change mm -hmm. their behavior, which I haven't seen any indication of that yet. <laughs> so I'm willing to, you know, it, 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 anyone who can stand up in public and say I was wrong I think should be applauded. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's sort of commendable behavior. Um, but I, I just haven't seen that happen yet. And until I do, I think I'm done listening to them. Mm -hmm. Me too. Well, thank you, Dr. Peter Ballastead, for your time and for being a part of the summit. It's been amazing. Are you okay if um, I have your uh, contact details obviously below if anyone has questions that they're curious that have come up from this conversation that they might need a bit of clarity on are you okay with people um, reaching out and asking on your pages and things like that absolutely I'm, I'm mm. happy to communicate um, you know if somebody wants to email me that's fine uh, peter.ballersted at gmail.com or if you want to interact on social media that's fine too um, please do. Great. Excellent. Thanks so much. Thank you.